Lisa, what is your favorite yokai? This, I'm a little torn on this because on the one hand, I'm very profoundly a cat person. So I feel like I ought to say Bakineko, which is your like monster cat. But cats don't have a very good reputation in Japanese folklore. Uh, Bakineko are kind of evil. And if you start looking at other cat yokai, they just keep getting worse. Like Nekomata is worse than Bakineko, and then Kasha is even worse than Nekomata. <laughs> like, all right. <clears throat> so I think I, I might have to go for the ones that are just random because especially in the context of something where there's a game there's this tendency to say any supernatural creature like it needs to have stats it needs to have powers it needs to be something we could make like a confrontation out of with the pcs but you get these yokai like mokumokuren is just something where if you don't take care of your shoji your rice paper screens and you let holes form in the paper then a mokuren will move in and possess it and there will be eyeballs like blinking at you out of those holes and that's it. That's all it does. It blinks at you. And 4th edition L5R actually like made this attempt to stat up the Mokuren as some kind of Shadowlands creature that was like a danger to people. <laughs> I'm just like, no, all it does is blink at you. <laughs> or uh, my sister finds it ridiculous that I have a much harder time remembering the Japanese word for floor than I do for ceiling. And the reason I know ceiling is because there's a yokai, which is the uh, Tenjo Name, and it literally just means ceiling liquor. And this yokai exists to explain why you, like, wind up with these stains on your ceiling. It's because the Tenjo Name has been licking your ceiling. There you go. That's, it just licks the ceiling. That's all. It's not a dark mantle. It's not going to drop on you and try to suffocate you. It licks your ceiling. I, I think my favorite is the animated umbrella. I actually have a spreadsheet I made of all of the different yokai from the books I was using as sources so that I could go through and go, all right, how could I use these in the plot? So I have that one in there. I don't think I worked it into the story, though. Well, it was in the background. It's one of the extras. Yeah, I think my favorite is the flaming wagon wheel one, though. Oh, um, that one I do mention. I can't remember if it's that one. I, I think that might be the name of it. Yeah, there is a mention of that one. That definitely starts heading off in directions that, for L5R purposes, I would say, I could see that being more Jigoku, because it's a flaming wagon wheel with the screaming corpse of a, a naked woman who's being, like, tormented in hell. It. So it, it's going off in some directions that sound... A little more ominous. But I will say, I'm glad that Fantasy Flight has uh, undid a lot of what AEG did, where, like, the earlier versions of the game turned everything supernatural into something tainted. And I'm like, you can't get a lot of the flavor of the source material if everything is tainted and connected to Jigoku. So I'm really glad that Fantasy Flight has changed that such that you've got much more of these other kinds of yokai, these other sorts of spiritual things that aren't all immediately evil. Now, of course, if all your yokai and your story were restricted to just licking the ceilings, then this probably would not be quite as uh, dramatic. No, there, there are more dangerous ones. Like the aforementioned cat, worse cat, even worse cat, even worse yeah. than that cat. <laughs> yeah. And even the ones that are dangerous, sometimes they just... They sound a little bit random and weird when you're used to game-style monsters, because there's a giant severed head that will, like, land on people and crush them. And you're like, on the one hand, that is dangerous. On the other hand, it's going boing, boing, boing around town. There's also a foot that can descend, I think, from the ceiling or from the, the sky, and it's just the foot. It's like, this is so weird. But even some of the simpler ones, like I, some of the earliest stuff that gets mentioned in the novel is a number of things that are almost more in the direction of, like, poltergeist activity. So there's a reference to how a length of cloth that was going to be used to sew a piece of clothing suddenly animated and tried to strangle people. Like, even the simple things can be dangerous. So how do you go about researching all of this? So there's a guy named Matthew Meyer who runs a website called yokai.com. And actually, as we're recording this, he's running a Kickstarter for his fourth collection. He's putting out these books about yokai. The first of which is called The Night Parade of a Hundred Demons. And uh, that was just invaluable. It's not the only book that I read on yokai or books, but when I said I made that spreadsheet, literally what I was doing was sitting down with his books and going through page by page saying, okay, yeah, I can use that one. Nope, that's not going to fit. Definitely use that. <laughs> and so that was my, my primary resource. I owe a huge amount to him. I also emailed him at one point with a question because I couldn't find... I mentioned this is a mining village, and I really wanted, if possible to have some kind of yokai that would be doing something in the mines. So I emailed him, and unfortunately, I, what I was thinking of is something along the lines of a knocker from Cornish folklore, 
which are very much a fairy that is associated with mines and with miners. But there doesn't seem to be anything like that in Japan. I, I asked him and he couldn't think of anything. And he has a more encyclopedic knowledge of yokai than anybody I know of in the English language. So, <laughs> so that's how you see it working all over the place. The way Second views peasants is what as base normal like samurai for Rokugan, you think? Let me put it this way. There's, without trying to drag this too far into real world stuff, if you look at the problems with racism in the real world, seconds on the kind of like well-intentioned but clueless end of things. And there absolutely would be people who have much stronger prejudices and much more of the, the peasants just fundamentally don't matter as much as the samurai. Same as we have with other kinds of prejudice in the real world. And historically in European history, uh, there's an awful lot of the, the, the kind of the, the thing you keep hearing is that uh, my clan in, in the kind of L5R fandom, my clan is the smart one that's worked out that we need the peasants to grow our food. Right. Historically, <laughs> no one did that. And yeah, yeah. Historically, it was always like there will always be more peasants who can do that for us, or the ones that we still have can just work harder because they're inherently lazy, that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it's absolutely the kind of thing where when you're looking at it in a game or in a fictional context, you can say, clearly, if you just did X, Y, Z, everybody would prosper more. And yet, strangely, when it comes to applying that in the real world, nobody ever seems to do it. Or rarely Sadly, seems to. Sadly, but yeah, it's very, yeah, very true. Yeah. So do you see that, do you think that Rokugan's class structure is different from historical Japanese. I do, I do. And this is something that I, I've seen debated a lot among players. I know I've said before, one of the things I love about this fandom is the extent to which not everybody involved in it, but a much higher percentage than the average populace. People are, let me trot out my arguments about Edo period caste structure or whatever. <laughs> like, it's a remarkably well-informed group overall. And yeah, it's definitely taking... Uh, it's model from a particular period in Japanese history. And first of all, what it's modeling wasn't true at all periods. And Rokugan definitely combines things from the Heian period, the Sengoku period, the Edo period. And then also it gets treated, I think, as more rigid than such things usually are in real life. There's more slippage, there's more weird edge cases and such in real history. Things like the whole, okay, adopting <clears throat> this peasant as your son and heir, or something like that. Uh, or things like, all right, this person did really well, and so they're basically going to be raised up in their class as a reward for their service. That being done with Toku for the monkey clan in the old lore, that was a huge deal, right? Was, oh my god, you know, this peasant. Line, yeah. Exactly. And that kind of thing wasn't nearly as rare in history as we depicted as being in the fictional setting. And there's ways in which a game is not the best place for getting into all of the nuance and the exceptions and the edge cases and so forth, because you want to be able to give players, here's how things work, and you only have to learn it once. Uh, and it's the same thing that you see with the clans and so forth, that you don't have the clans like getting obliterated and then a new clan comes and takes their place in the way that you would get in real history. But I, I like having some of that slippage, which is why the whole thing with the dragon of we're just going to adopt some peasants on the DL makes for an interesting plot because that kind of thing brings in that complexity. I also liked that, even if we're not talking about the difference between samurai and, and non-samurai, commoners, I actually really liked the tension between the two protagonists because you've got our, our dragon who's from a vassal family and he's someone who's a straight-up agasha. Sorry, not a gash. I do, do apologize. He's, he's Asako. Straight yeah. up Asako. Yeah, there's, he's dealing with someone who's a straight up Asako. Yeah, like an actual mainline family, capital F family. It's like, <gasps> yeah. I, I like Yeah, it. and I've actually, in the short fictions that I write, practically any place I get the opportunity, I jam in some like vassal uh, family member somewhere in the corner. And it's because when I ran my own campaign, I really played out the vassal families a lot in order to give, to make the main families not as much of a monolith and to make more of those rank distinctions between samurai. Actually, the, the way that I did it in my game was I made a one point advantage. If you wanted to be a member of the main family rather than a vassal, then you had to buy that advantage. And it didn't, you know, give you a huge benefit, but it was just, you were a little bit above somebody who was at the same rank as you, but was from a vassal family. And yeah, I wanted to play with that so that uh, you have on the one side, second is like higher ranking, wealthier, more influential family, but he's also in Dragonland, so Ryotora 
His word should go, but he's got an inferiority complex around this. It, it allowed me to create a bit more character tension there and to show that, yeah, there are gradations within the samurai class. It's not that they're all basically equal with each other unless one of them explicitly has authority over the other. Makes total sense to me.